Track ready. Jaunty angle, check. Strong Pimlico, the nourishing food to make men fat and breed pure blood. Deep Pimlico, the well of glee that draws up merry company. Pip, pip, tally-ho, Jules Guides here, in which I wander around London and tell you fascinating facts. And today we are indeed in Pimlico, which is actually named after a fella called Ben Pimlico up in Hoxton, who invented an extremely strong ale. And it was said to be so strong that it made people go a little bit crazy. But then there was this woman called the Ale Wife of England, who used to sell this very strong beer. And in order to cash in on the reputation of this Ale Wife of England, there was another brewery down here called the Stag Brewery. They started selling this beer and gradually the whole area became known as Pimlico after this incredibly strong beer. Say ribble. Ribble. Say bobble. Bobble. Say Pimlico. Pimlico. Ribble bobble Pimlico. Ribble, bobble, pimlico. I haven't pimlico. lost my mind yet. There's a, a fella called Kurt Schwitters. He developed some sound experiment. And it acts as a vocal exercise for actors. My favourite one is the one that Giles Brandreth does. Hip bath, hip bath, lavatory, lavatory, bide, bide, douche. <laughs> ribble bobble pimlico, Can ribble bobble pimlico. Stop now over here. <laughs> Sorry. Take a rest, Jill. I think you need to take a rest. <laughs> so we're starting here at Tate Britain because this is where the old Millbank Penitentiary used to be. I know I've spoken about it before, but it's quite interesting. Millbank Penitentiary was the main prison for transporting prisoners to Australia. So this opened up in 1816, but by about 1890, I think they stopped doing transportation to Australia. So it, it turned into a normal prison by then, um, and eventually it closed. And around 1899, so Henry Tate, who made a fortune out of uh, importing sugar, you see it written on the sugar bags, Tate and Lyle Sugar. Donated his massive art collection to be the, the main basis for the art gallery. We can't go and film in there, but round the back there's something really cool. Those are from bombs, aren't they? Oh, probably, yeah. Looks like shrapnel from the wall, that, yeah. Yeah, that is. That is the Chelsea College of Art. Jules is a philistine, so he doesn't want to mention it. He's too busy being hot. How very dare you? I'm boiling. He's not That's... interested in art in the slightest. <laughs> I am. It's very interesting, because look here, they've got this excellent ditch. This is, uh, well, it's now just used for hanging people's laundry out and stuff like that, but it's, uh, this, this used to go all the way around the Millbank Penitentiary. If you look at a map of the area from above, you can see more or less the same shape and layout as the, as the old Millbank Penitentiary. This horrible, stagnant, infested water that surrounded the prison here probably contributed to the cholera epidemic that they had in there, which I think ultimately contributed to the place being closed down, I suppose. This is a remnant of Victorian England. It's one of the only parts that still survives. It's like a, a bollard for tying the ropes around of the ships or the, the hulks, they were called. Not just, the, not a big green monster. It was a, the hulks, they were kind of um, barges for transporting the prisoners from here a little bit further down the Thames to where they would be finally transported to Australia. And I dare say that if you're watching in Australia now and one of your ancestors was um, a convict, they probably touched this very bollard on their way down the ramp onto the boat. How about that? Touching history. And this is the Morpeth Arms. They built this in 1845. This was specifically for the prison wardens to come and drink in. And underneath the pump, they've got some old service tunnels still, which survive from that time. They used to transport the prisoners under through this tunnel to the ships. And it wasn't just men who were transported, they'd take women and children too. This is like, so it, it obviously stops there, but it presumably it continued further on, but they blocked it off. They used to hold people in here, look. Imagine how tall, imagine a tall bloke like me with about 20 other people stuck in here. Yeah, but I mean, honestly, it would, this would be horrendous. And, and the, the youngest person was a woman called, well, a girl called Mary Wade, who was only like 11, some people say 13, and she was convicted, actually sentenced to death for stealing another woman's clothes. Now, because it was a time when King George III finally got better, because he was the mad king, he, he managed to get better. Um, as a celebration of getting better, he decided to reprieve a lot of these people who were sentenced to death. So she ended up being transported to Australia and actually living till about 80. So she did all right for herself in the end. She probably had a much nicer life. He would have gone all the way through to the prison one way and then to the river the other way. So it was another little sort of way for the, for the prisoners to come 
come through. And you're not actually usually allowed down here, especially during COVID, but he's kindly allowed us down here. So don't keep calling him asking for a tour of the tunnel. It'll drive them mad. The river is out of the boat. The tide is out. And um, London is built on all these underground rivers. So the Tyburn River that comes down through Hampstead, under Marylebone, and then under Buckingham Palace. And finally, it exits here under Vauxhall Bridge, just over there. You think you can see where, it's, uh, where it comes out. You walk around London and you see these statues, you often wonder who they are. I mean, he's portrayed here in sort of Roman toga. He looks as though he might be an emperor or something, but he isn't. He was a 19th century MP. William Huskinson is his name. He sadly, in 1830, he acquired the dubious honour of having been the first person to die in a rail accident. They were opening, I think it was the Manchester to Liverpool Railway, and uh, he was travelling in a special carriage created just for the Duke of Wellington. And then they stopped to take on some water, I think. They stopped and so they got out to have a mill around a little bit. Then this warning came along. Oh, by the way, the, uh, the other train's coming, other is approaching, get back onto the train. And this poor fellow was a bit doddery. He dawdled and then he couldn't make up his mind whether to go that way or that way. And he got hit by the rocket and the Duke of Wellington's train was being driven by George Stevenson. So this was quite a big event and the poor fellow died. First rail accident casualty. Had he not died, however, no one would have ever heard of him. It's good to be remembered somehow, isn't it? Next thing he knew, he was a statistic. Hark, is that a cabman shelter I see before me? I know I go on about them, but you definitely get two points if you spot a cabman shelter. You know who um, came up with the idea of cabman shelters? The Earl of Shaftesbury. You know Shaftesbury Avenue in Piccadilly Circus? That's named after the Earl of Shaftesbury, who was a great philanthropist. And he decided it was a bit unfair on these poor old cab drivers, you know, with the horse and carts, because they had to stay with their cab at all times. So if you wanted to go to a cafe or something and go and get some uh, coffee or whatever, they couldn't because they, someone had run off with their horse. It's not supposed to be any bigger than a horse and cart. In 1875, around 60 of them popped up so that cab drivers could get good and wholesome refreshments at moderate prices. Like bacon and egg for three quid. Not bad, actually, this. Pity it's not open. I'm pretty hungry. I could do with that. This little kind of nursery school here, kindergarten, this was the one where Princess Diana used to work. When she was Lady Diana Spencer, she was photographed here in a see-through skirt and causing a lot of scandal. She was very upset about it, actually. She wasn't happy at all. Everyone does it these days, but back in those days, it was a lot more risque. This is St George's Square. It's the only London square which is built facing the river. But I'm on the trail of a vampire. It's pretty bad. That's a proper fang. Oh, my God. I'm actually a vampire. I think Julian is actually a vampire. <laughs> Somewhere around here is where Bram Stoker lived, who wrote Dracula, the most famous vampire of them all. 14. Now 27 is over there. Hello. I was looking for, for uh, Bram Stoker house. I come from Romania. I'm from Transylvania. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> Amazing. I was in, uh, in Sigishwara, Dracula's town. Well, and you moved closer to here to be closer to your Lord of Darkness. Yes, I'm from uh, Carpentier Mountains. <laughs> oh, I better watch out. You're not one of Dracula's brides, are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Bram Stoker died in 1912, in the same week that the Titanic sank. So his obituary he got sort of buried on page 15 of the Times. But number 26 seems to have vanished into thin air, like a phantom. <laughs> Do you reckon that maybe a bomb dropped here and knocked them all down? Yeah, they I must have been here. There was a bomb. You can see there's a whole load of houses missing. I think it must have been there. Blooming Luftwaffe. I think it's far more interesting that he most likely died of syphilis. Oh, yes, that's true. <laughs> and if you go to the London Library in St James's Square, they found the books that he used for his research into vampires and stuff, and, and it's got all his notes in the margin. Marginalia, they call it. Vandal, defacing library books, I don't know. And in 1824, Thomas Cubitt was commissioned by Richard Grosvenor, the Marquis of Westminster, to redevelop this whole area. So, you know, the whole of Pimlico, so it used to just be marshes and stuff, but they reclaimed the soil from St. Catherine's Dock and they put it here and they built all this amazing stuff on it. And you can see it's all about you. It is all, all, all these sort of white stucco 
houses, I think they're called. Stoke Newington as well, he did Highbury. He was actually a carpenter from Norfolk. He extended Buckingham Palace because originally Buckingham Palace was just a little house. It was Buckingham House, which King George used to go and live at, but he wasn't really a palace. He was just one of his country residences. But when they later just turned it into more of a palace, they redeveloped the east entrance. Strictly speaking, that's the back of the house, but they turned that into the front of the house. In fact, Queen Victoria was very fond of him. She says of him, in the, here's a sphere of life, a better, kind-hearted and more simple, unassuming man never breathed. To which he replied, yeah, sorry, it's a bit more expensive than I thought it was going to be. Uh, we're going to have to charge you a few quid extra. Can you make us a cup of tea? Five sugars, please, yeah. <laughs> This over here is Dolphin Square, one of the most notorious residences in London. When it was built in the 30s, it was the biggest block of flats in Europe. It was heated with water, heated up from the Batty Power Station. It's like a little secret world in there. They've got their own supermarket with a shopping centre and everything. How the other half live, eh? Wow, it's very pretty. It's just like a whole oasis. Isn't that lovely? I wouldn't mind living here. It's really popular with members of Parliament. I mean, this is where Lord Sewell, the House of Lords peer, was recently filmed snorting cocaine with a couple of prostitutes. Makes you proud to be British. And it was here that that English spy master, Maxwell Knight, who was the inspiration for M in James Bond, he was actually the one who recruited Ian Fleming into MI5 here. I don't know how they managed to fool anybody. They look like comedy parodies of spies. Mandy Rice Davis lived here with Christine Keeler during the Profumo affair and most impressively Winston Churchill's daughter was evicted because she was throwing bottles of gin out the window at people. Yeah, so this is the, the Joseph Bazalgette Western pumping station where they take all your poos and effluence and pump it from the west side of London over to the east. I don't know what the East London want with all the poos. I suppose that must be where the treatment works is. But then they purify it, I suppose, and probably send it out into the Thames. I don't know. Damn it, Jim, I'm a filmmaker, not a scientist. It was completed in 1875 as the final piece of the jigsaw in Bazalgette's drainage system for London. But anyway, no, you can go inside on uh, open house weekends. Um, every year they have this weekend when they open up all these buildings which aren't usually open to the public. And uh, that would be a cool place to go and visit, actually. I'd quite like to get inside there. This is the Grosvenor Canal. This was built in 1824. And this is the only part of the Grosvenor Canal that you can still see. In the 18th century, it started life as a little creek which sort of fed water from the Thames through a pump and into these reservoirs, which ultimately provided drinking water for West Londoners. I don't know how clean it was. And eventually Richard Grosvenor, who owned all this land in Westminster, had the canal built and it led all the way up to Victoria Station. I think it fell into disuse after the, the building of the railways and they started building all these houses and stuff on top. But um, it's actually the last canal in London to have been used commercially. It was right up until 1995. They used to take stuff on barges out to the river over there, because that's the Thames right over there. This is Chelsea Bridge. We've actually covered this area in the Battersea film, but uh, I must get hold of Monica and her mudlarks, because it might, might be worth going down here onto the banks now that the tide's out, because you might find some Roman treasure. This is where uh, Julius Caesar crossed the river when he invaded Britain in 54 BC. But uh, at the end of the bridge there, you see all the coats of arms. They're rather nice. You can see uh, this one here has the winged bull of Chelsea, I think it is, and, uh, and the, the stag and what have you. I think that one represents Chelsea and the portcullis over there represents Westminster and on the other side of them I think it's the London County Council or something like that if they still exist pardon my ignorance you see that hospital over there that's the the list of hospital it's not an NHS hospital it's a private hospital I think it's owned by the Americans um, and Joseph Lister pioneered uh, the use of antiseptic during operations they named Listerine mouthwash after him I mean you know he's not to be confused with Robert Liston 
who was known as the fastest knife in the West End. He could perform an amputation in something like 28 seconds, and he once amputated someone's leg so quickly that he accidentally cut off his testicles as well. He's like, he's like, he was so fast, he was like, just, 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 oh, sorry, mate, you know. And on another occasion, so he accidentally slashed the fingers of one of the medical spectators there, and he also slashed one of the onlookers, and all three of them ended up dying. So he has the dubious honour of being the only surgeon ever to have performed an operation with a 300% mortality rate. <laughs> But why are you talking about him so much when this is the wrong bloke? This yeah, is Lister. Because he's quite amusing and I don't want you to confuse Robert, like Joseph Lister for Robert Liston. Well, Lister is more important now. Yeah, well, they did blame Lister. Now, just a little bit past Chelsea Bridge is the Chelsea Hospital, which was built in 1681. And you guessed it, it was designed by Sir Christopher Wren. And that's where the Chelsea pensioners stay. It's like a retirement home for ex-servicemen. And they have those beautiful red uniforms. But about 100 years after that, in 1781, this fellow called Thomas Robinson, who was the uh, director of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, he decided to create these uh, pleasure gardens called the Ranley Pleasure Gardens. And they had balloon ascents and stuff. It was one of the main entertainment wonders of the age, especially this huge uh, Rococo Rotunda, which is about 120 metres wide, and it had tiers for spectators, and it had chimneys, fireplaces. King George III came here. Even Mozart performed here in 1765, aged just nine. He, he amazed the crowds uh, because he lived up the road there. And Canaletto did beautiful paintings of it. Sadly, in 1803, they demolished it. I'm imagining it right here that Mozart performed as a nine-year-old in 1765. So that I were where I would be, then I would be where I am not. But where I am, there I must be, and where I would be, I cannot. <laughs> We've actually strayed a bit outside Pimlico because there was this thing that was quite connected. I thought it was so necessary to go talk about it. But uh, sometimes the only danger is that you get these professional cyclists who cycle along here at Mach 3 um, in their Lycra. I mean, personally, I don't think that men should ever wear Lycra, but especially middle-aged men, but there we go. I'm obsessed with weather vanes. You see that beautiful weather vane with, uh, with Mozart on it? That's actually a weather vane kind of sign. It's indicating that Mozart lived down here on Ebury Street at number 180. Mozart came to London with his dad in the 18th century. He actually composed his first symphony in his house when he was eight years old. That's not bad. Well, it's true, and also, if he was seven, he would have got his Instagram account suspended. But I've had my Instagram account suspended. By the way, just in case you're watching this at a time when Jules Guy's Instagram, I might, I might have to create a new Instagram, just to let you know, in case you've been trying to contact me and I've been ignoring you. I haven't been ignoring you. They've suspended my Instagram account. Over here, which uh, where the Mozart statue is, that's Ebury Street, which was the main route from the Ranley Pleasure Gardens up towards Buckingham House, which is where King George III lived. Because before they turned it into Buckingham Palace, it was just Buckingham House, one of his uh, smaller kind of country retreats. He'd come up here, but down here, just between Bourne Street and some other past small gardens or something, this is Bun House Place. This is where the Chelsea bun was first invented. I think it was Richard Hand and Mrs Hand. They ran the Chelsea bun house. And King George II and King George III were both known to come down here and buy these Chelsea buns on their way back to Buckingham House. The funny thing is we haven't been able to find one anywhere in Chelsea. It has come to this. Do you sell Chelsea buns? No, I don't. Oh. What? Buns. Oh, look, yeah, donuts. No Chelsea buns. Oh. There's not bakery around here, no bakery. About 50,000 people would queue outside because there were so many people. It's like Wembley Stadium or something going over to the Radley Pleasure Garden. Of course, when the Pleasure Gardens closed, they closed down too, sadly. <laughs> Beardsley. 
Excellent. You see now, it's a pity we couldn't go into the Aubrey Beard City exhibition at the Tate Britain, but this is where he lived. Ahead of his time, outrageous artist, very, very famous at his time. He was like a superstar, really. I mean, you say that I don't appreciate art, but anyone of my generation who was just getting into art and literature and sex would have been fascinated by him as a teenager. These days, we famously remember him for illustrating Oscar Wilde's works like Salome. And they even inspired the Beatles' Revolver album cover. You probably recognise it. But uh, Oscar Wilde was actually quite mean about him. He said he had a face like a silver hatchet and grass-green hair. He himself said he looked like a gargoyle. A lot of his illustrations got censored because they were quite obscene. I mean, Lysistrata was outrageous. They had these blokes with, like, huge erections and stuff. And even in the Tate, they still have to have a warning on the room. But some of them were caricatures of Oscar Wilde. You can see in the background the sort of big moon-faced Oscars. He was quite mean about him. I think he was actually the happiest he ever was, was he, when he was living here. He held parties here for all these great famous celebrities of the day. Thursday night salons, they were called. It sounds like he was so ahead of his time, living in the like 19th century, but with 21st century attitude to erotica. I suppose these days he would have been probably a punk or something. And as we rather encourage anything grotesque in Jules Guides, we rather like Aubrey Beardsley because he said, uh, he said of himself, I have one aim, the grotesque. If I'm not grotesque, I am nothing. And he sadly died age 25, scoffing and spitting up blood of tuberculosis. But in his death throes, he suddenly felt a pang of guilt, maybe because he was <laughs> staring at this church the whole time out of his window. And he wrote to his publisher saying, Jesus is our Lord and judge. Dear friend, I implore you to destroy all copies of Lysistrata and bad drawings. By all that is holy, all obscene drawings, Aubrey Beardsley, in my death agony. Luckily for us, I suppose, his publishers didn't destroy all his drawings and we get to see them now. This is Eaton Square and it was originally a place called Five Fields, which was renowned for a sort of vice and highwaymen and ne'er-do-wells and beggars and thieves and prostitutes. Then they ruined it all by building all these beautiful houses. And because today is the 10th of August, it's the anniversary of the day in 1784 when the Chevalier de Moray, this French, well, he claimed to be a doctor, but he was a bit of a quack, charged admission to see him ascend in this balloon from five fields. It was right here. 60,000 people arrived and paid admission to come and see this amazing balloon ascent. But when it completely failed and he didn't manage to take off, this angry mob made for him to come and duff him up. But he was saved by some gentlemen. They just managed to destroy what was left of his little car and balloon. It was called Balloonomania, right? So then they had to build a balloonatic asylum. <laughs> Why didn't you want to put Vivian Lee in it? That's where she lived, just around there. I know, I forgot. Never mind. Tomorrow is always another day. <laughs> Frankly, I don't give a damn. Cheers, Louisa. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you enjoy these videos. And if you want to find out more about me, head over to my website, JulesGuys.com, where you can even book a guided tour and buy weird merchandise and all sorts. But at the moment, I'm banned from Instagram. So if I haven't replied to you on there, it's not because I, I'm ignoring you. It's just because of the weird powers that be. See you next time, folks. It's, it's, gone, to, it's gone to prison. <laughs> yeah, I've gone to, I'm being transported. Transported to Australia, the concrete.